<laughs> Hi, friends. Oh, man. Okay, apologies in advance for the mics that probably aren't really designed for like a dress as the way they clip to you. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys. So yes, patriarchy, yes. Ooh, relevant to the talk. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's really, really exciting to see some familiar faces and new faces in the audience. Uh, so as the wonderful introdu introducers said, I'm talking today about super black animals and what they might be able to tell us about conflicts in evolution. So when you think about evolution by natural selection, what comes to mind? Just shout out words or things that come to mind. <gasps> Someone say Darwin? Great answer. Darwin the Darwin finches. Okay, this is a crowd that knows about evolution. Yeah. So one major sort of tenet of evolution by natural selection is that animals adapt to their environment. So the idea is that one ancestor finch of Darwin's finches sort of diversified to become suited to a particular niche. So we've got the insect eating finch, you know, on the top up there with a very narrow beak for eating insects. And then in contrast, a seed-eating finch with a big, powerful beak for crushing seeds. So one way of thinking about evolution is that things need to be adapted to their environment. Another very common way of thinking, I'll illustrate with these beautiful rabbits. So if you lived in the snow and you were one of these rabbits, which rabbit would you want to be? <gasps> the white one, exactly. Um, the next thing I'm going to show is a simulation. It's not a real photo. This is a simulation of what might happen. I didn't want to show a real photo of a cute little rabbit getting torn up. Um, and the idea there is that you don't want to get eaten. So previous slide, you want to eat. This slide, you don't want to get eaten. And if you can blend in better to your environment, you're probably less likely to get snatched up by a hawk or another predator. So to summarize, evolution, eat and don't get eaten, <laughs> right? But is that the whole story? Very good, very good. I'm going to show you a few videos that I think don't quite fit in with this model, this idea of blending in. <laughs> you may have seen some of these before. <laughs> so this guy's doing sort of exactly the opposite of blending in. How many of you have seen that video before? A lot. Okay, I'm going to try to show you a succession of videos. Maybe you haven't seen this one. We'll find out. <gasps> this is another bird of paradise. The female. <gasps> okay, this I think is the cutest thing of all time. She's like, I'll spread my wings too. <gasps> <gasps> She's like, okay, all right, that's good. That's enough. <laughs> okay. So those are two of my favorite birds in the world. They're both birds of paradise. Um, did anyone see that there was recently a new species of bird of paradise described? Obviously, this is, I'm very in, you know, in this world. So I was like, oh, a new species. Um, and I think it's funny because the past two I think of as very lovable and cute, you know, adorable looking. This one I think looks a little bit more sinister. So let me just show you a brief clip of what it looks like. Doesn't it look evil? <laughs> but very black. The other one's happily hopping around. This guy looks, well, it actually reminds me of another famous character. I'll just play another quick video. <laughs> Doesn't the head shape look like Darth Vader? So what I really want to talk about today is how much this bird of paradise reminds me of Darth Vader. In which case, I think we have to extend the analogy and say that the happy, cute one is Luke Skywalker. <laughs> but I am digressing. Um, so a lot of you have already heard of birds of paradise. Have any of you heard of peacock spiders? 
A few, good, okay. Well, let me, the Australian, of course, knows about peacock spiders. Um, let me show you a few more videos, and this is just kind of to ground you. I think it's very important in biology to kind of get a sense of what you're looking at. When you work in a museum, a lot of times it's different to look at a so specimen sitting in a shelf versus the real animal. So here is a video of one of the many beautiful peacock spiders. He's looking for a female. He sees one. <laughs> <laughs> they have incredibly intricate dances. And as you can see, they too have incredibly brilliant color that has evolved. I'll just show you one more video of another one who's a little bit less happy because he has not yet found a female to display to. <laughs> <laughs> and the person who makes these videos is a brilliant scientist named Jurgen Otto. He's like the peacock spider maven. This spider, I think, is one of the most beautiful things in existence. You could fit 10 of them on your thumbnail, but they're reflecting light better than most man-made materials. So to bring it all back to what we were talking about before, this brings up the question, you know, we tend to think of evolution as survival of the fittest. But if you ask me, these things are really sticking out. I mean, why doesn't a hawk kill that one and a lizard kill that one, and they both are gone. You know, what led to them actually persisting through evolutionary time? It seems to me like they're wasting a lot of energy on their displays. It seems very wasteful. It seems like it would be better not to stick out. And I find myself asking the question, you know, why not just be brown? Why not have both male and female look like this, then you don't get spotted by the predator? And a lot of you are evolutionary biologists, I know, some of my lab mates back there in particular. Um, but evolution doesn't see the whole picture like that. So yeah, less energy would be spent if both of the birds were brown, but evolution doesn't sort of look at, it doesn't move in a directional way. And this you know, graphic displays how, what I think a lot of us think of as evolution, going from kind of worse to better, less evolved, more evolved. But that's completely wrong. Um, all that matters is making copies of yourself. So let's compare green guy with blue guy. If green guy makes nine babies and blue guy only makes three, I like think we all know who wins. Green. green, exactly. And it turns out that beauty is just a way of more effectively making copies of yourself, getting a mate. So then there's a sort of fundamental question here, which you know a few of us were talking about before this. What leads to the evolution of beautiful things? And in particular, why might somebody have a preference for something beautiful, especially something brightly colored and really elaborate like this? And biologists have come up with a few hypotheses, and I'll group them into three groups to run through them today. So one very popular hypothesis is that beauty is a signal of how healthy you are. So the most famous example of this comes from red birds. So red birds get their beautiful red color from special chemicals called carotenoid pigments. Has anyone here heard of carotenoids? Yeah, a few people have. Sometimes people that are very into health have heard of these because carotenoid pigments are actually very important for human health and for the health of many other animals. Uh, you can remember the name because carrots are full of carotenoids. And it turns out that carotenoids actually are very important in your immune system, among other uh, functions within your body. <laughs> so coming back to the hypothesis, the theory is that this red bird is sending out an honest signal of his health. He's basically saying, like, look how bright red my feathers are. You know, look how healthy my immune system is. I am a good mate. You should choose me. So this is theory number one. Honest signaling leads to the evolution of beauty. This theory I really like, and this one is called sensory bias, and it's the idea that maybe males are just taking advantage of pre-existing preferences in females. And I'll take a quick moment here to say, I'm using this sort of binary of sex in this talk that, you know, females choose males. Males evolve elaborate beautiful traits and females choose them. And that's true for everything I'll talk about today, but many animals have evolved a wide variety of systems. Sometimes females are the ones that are beautiful and males choose. Humans are very complex. Uh, if you want to talk more about humans, talk to Ava and Jenna. <laughs> but so back to, back to this theory. So, this came about from a few different animal systems. One of my favorites is guppies. So there are some guppies that live in rivers. This is a female guppy, it's pretty brown and drab looking. In these particular rivers, sometimes orange fruits fall into the river. So females that learn a preference for orange things do better than females that don't. So in these populations of guppies, all the females like the color orange. 
because of these orange fruits, which are healthy and very good for them. So the theory goes like this. When a bunch of males come along and one of them happens to be orange, she already has a preference for the color orange in her head. So, exactly, so she selects the orange male. So this theory is called sensory bias, and there's a lot of good evidence for this happening, for males kind of sneakily taking advantage of traits or preferences the females already have. So there's two theories, maybe it's honest, maybe it's sensory bias, and the third theory, Rick Prom's theory, which we were discussing uh, right before. Yeah, exactly. Um, and his idea is that maybe traits, or sorry, maybe preferences are just completely arbitrary. Um, and he recently wrote a book about this that has been making a lot of rounds and getting a lot of press. Uh, his book is called The Evolution of Beauty. And his idea is that, look, beauty just happens because females just have arbitrary aesthetic preferences. You know, why do we all like listening to some musical songs and not others? Why do we like looking at sunsets? Uh, why do we think certain things are beautiful and certain things are not? Maybe it's just arbitrary. And his big point is this is a good starting point. We know we have preferences. Let's just assume they happen arbitrarily and then go from there and look for evidence of other driving causes. So we've got three <laughs> key arguments for why a female might have a preference at all, why she might like the color blue. Does anybody have any questions about these three models of what might lead to a preference evolving? Yes? Yes, great point. I think that you're right, in fact, for all of those. No matter what you know, she likes, they're going to evolve to impress her. So that's a very good point. Some animals, uh, um, they have, like, like, they have like, like muscles. Some things like to yeah. impress on sales. Yeah, sometimes. this is a great point, that things like muscles or big ornaments evolve. And sometimes they evolve so that the males can fight with each other. So there's many, many ways of sexual selection operating, all boiling down to convincing somebody else to mate with you. Very good. Mm. So then, again, this explains why she might have a preference for something like the color blue. But if you ask me, this is a very extreme trait. I mean, the birds of paradise, here's some more photos of more of them. They are some of the strangest animals on Earth. And so we don't have to, or we can't just explain why a female might have a preference. We have to explain what causes this extreme elaboration of the traits. And so to think about that, I think of it as an interaction between male appearance and then female preference and perception. So what the female can see and you know, what she prefers. So if you're the female, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, is this a guy a good mate? You know, would we make offspring that are fit? Would I have good you know, fitness if I mate with this guy? But he has a different uh, priority. He says, I will do anything to mate with her. <laughs> and so there is a very fundamental conflict of interest between males and females in this system, and in fact, in many other systems, because it tends to be the case that females invest more in their offspring. Again, humans, we're not determined by our evolutionary history, except in certain ways, but in the animals I study, there's a very fundamental conflict of interest. And I like to think of it as a relationship between an examiner and an examinee. So she's kind of setting up some sort of test to see if the male can pass it. So let's think about an analogy or two. Instead of looking at males and females, let's think about it as a professor and students. So another case where the professor is trying to examine the students. So the professor is thinking to herself, I wonder if they're learning. You know, let's make a quiz and see if they're learning. The students think, we're going to do anything we can to get an A on this quiz, right? So the professor wants to test sort of their learning, how much they've picked up, uh, but the students very quickly find ways to just memorize things to pass the test or even to cheat to pass the test. Another way of thinking about this is the professor wants an honest sort of reflection of how well people are doing. So she says, all right, guys, we're going to have a C average grade, and it'll be a curve from there, which, you know, the days of that happening at Harvard are long past. <laughs> um, and one reason is the students don't want that at all. You know, their entire motivation is we want A's, and we're going to give you bad professor ratings unless we get A's. So the professor then is forced to inflate grades. And if you look at a graph talking about the change in grades over time, A's now make up almost half of grades. And I think that's a very interesting number, that it's almost half. 
because when A's become half of your grades, suddenly the students are happy. Suddenly the majority of your students are no longer going to be bugging you to get higher grades. So I like, I like to think of this as sort of a cool game theoretical dilemma here, where maybe we're hitting an equilibrium state. We'll see. That's my prediction. <laughs> So this kind of conflict of interest leads to an arms race. So let's talk a little bit about what I mean by arms race. I think arms races and conflict are absolutely fundamental to evolution. This is a pronghorn. Has anybody seen pronghorn in the wild? They live in the US. Yes, good, OK, at least one. Um, as you may know, pronghorn can run very fast, 60 miles per hour. Have you ever seen them running along next to a car? Or jogging. Or jogging, yes. I guess why would they run so fast all the time? <laughs> But this is a real mystery. Why can the pronghorn run so fast? There is no other animal in the US and in the Americas that can run this fast. Does anybody know why the pronghorn is this, is this speedy? There's, well, the, the I, theory is that cheetahs evolved in the same location as the pronghorn, and then they got isolated from them. Excellent answer. <laughs> I'm very impressed. There was a cheetah that lived with the pronghorn and is now extinct. Uh, and I, this is kind of a joke, 59 miles per hour. They probably ran about the same pace. Um, so the pronghorn is left with this evolutionary relic, this extremely fast speed for no reason anymore because the cheetah is now extinct. And this is an example of evolutionary conflict. It's an example that's very easy to see because it's about running speed, but conflict in evolution is shaped by many, many years of selection. So sometimes something goes extinct and the relics of conflict are still left. I wanted to put a picture of my advisor, David Hay, because this is the sort of thing that he studies. He's uh, the maven of conflict. So again, this is one example of an arms race where, you know, no pronghorn is going to be ready to get eaten, so speed increases and increases and increases over time, even though it would be a lot easier if they both just ran at 10 miles per hour. That'd be much easier for them. And another famous example of evolutionary conflict is a little bit more surprising. Pregnancy, as it turns out, in humans and in many other animals, is a site of intense conflict and of intense arms races. I'm going to call up my lab mates again because both Jenna and Ava study pregnancy and, and certain aspects of it. And a short way of explaining why there's conflict there is that there's a give and take between the baby and mom. And in general, the baby wants to get more from mom than the mom wants to give. And this is because the baby is half mom, but it's also half dad. So it's got sort of half of its genome is pushing it to be more selfish. Um, and it's important to note that this is, it's as if we're watching a tug of war, especially in the case of pregnancy. You know, most, most times you're pregnant and you carry a child to term, things turn out fine. It's not like you're actually fighting. But in this case, the tug of war, the rope's not moving at all, but people are pulling really hard on both sides. And that's a good analogy to keep in your mind when you think about evolutionary conflict. So uh, my lab mate Ava has said before, conflict breeds complexity. I think that's very true. And I've sort of identified three eyes of evolutionary conflict to keep in mind. So one is that it can often be invisible. And my analogy I like to use for this is the Cold War which either, I think it was maybe Reagan said, the Cold War was won without firing a single shot. But those of us who know about history know that there was a lot of time and energy and lives lost in the Cold War. Mm. Conflict is inefficient. So returning to the Cold War, you know, both the US and the former Soviet Union were stockpiling nuclear weapons basically for no reason except that we were each worried that if we didn't keep up, you know, we would be obliterated. Would have been much more efficient to just make zero nukes total. And finally, it's very innovative. So when you have a lot of parties that are in conflict with each other, you can do things like send a man to the moon. And the same, I think, is true in evolution. So these things are all true for the case of pregnancy and for this sort of pronghorn arms race. And what I want to talk to you today about is whether or not it's true for sexual selection in these extreme birds of paradise. So. You know, for half of this equation, remember half of the equation is what the female can see, and half of the equation is what the male can make, what he can look like. If we think about how bird vision works, it seems to me that it's pretty elaborate, like way too good for what they need to do just to eat and not get eaten. So for example, here's an example of a bird, what we might see as humans with our sort of pretty good color vision. To a bird, this bird is you know, flush with all sorts of beautiful colors because not only can birds see ultraviolet light, which we can't see, but they're much better at seeing the visible spectrum as well. And they're much, much better at discriminating between two colors that are almost the same. 
on a bird retina, they've got a distribution of these color sensitive cells that's mathematically hyper uniform. This is a word that means like perfectly arranged so no two of the same cell are next to each other. So again, like extremely, extremely well adapted for very fine scale color discrimination. And they have 12 times as many of these color sensitive cells as we do, um, just comparing two very visual animals. So to me, this is already a big sign of conflict. This seems one, very innovative, you know, being able to see all these colors many animals cannot see, and also very inefficient. What is the adaptive purpose of being able to see colors very carefully? And I think the answer is that it's an arms race. So it's almost time to get into the cool data, but first, a question break. Any questions about this theory, about the arms race theory, or about evolution in general? Yes? Um, all these examples you have of the bears are very beautiful. Uh, it sounds like a very nice in some places where there's a lot of vegetation or animals. Uh -huh. But for example, having Arizona, and Arizona is like uh, everything is rocks and brown. <laughs> and it's like, you don't see that kind of colors. And I never seen a beautiful, like a colorful animal in the yeah. desert. Maybe there are, but I, I, I live in the desert, I didn't see anything. Yeah, this is a great point. I think the environment is hugely important. Um, if, oh yeah, let me read this. So the question is, it seems like it must depend on the environment, like how much vegetation there is, because in Arizona, where you're from, all the animals are brown, basically, right? It's the color is like a pretty much everything is the same color. Yeah. Yeah, and things are mostly the same color. So I think it's, it's all about the balance between natural selection and sexual selection in general. So if you're spending all your time sort of avoiding predators, or if your environment is very scarce with resources, that's gonna be a very big drive. Just surviving is a big enough drive. But also, animals find other ways to attract mates. So there are a lot of cool birds in Arizona that sing very beautiful songs, which I think is a sort of another dimension along which mate choice can operate. But I think you're absolutely right to think about this as sort of a tension between how good is your environment, how rich with resources is it, before you can become a bird of paradise and look like this. Totally agree. Great question. Yes? What kinds of um, experiments were performed in the past to, to establish this uh, fact that birds can discriminate colors so much more finely than we can? That's a great question. So one type of, ex oh, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Okay, the question is what kind of experiments were done to show that bird color vision is so good? So one easy kind is train a bird to pick the greener color. So you do this starting with a bunch of very easy colors like green versus yellow, green versus blue, but then you make it green versus bluish green, green versus greenish, 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 blue, and they can go far, far beyond what we can do. So that kind of choice experiment um, now complemented by really rich neuroscience and sensory perception. Great question. Yes? Uh, could, uh, could its vision be uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, like, uh, it's related to dinosaurs and dinosaurs have eyes to look for prey? Yeah, I think, so, so, so the great, factors? yeah, dinosaurs? so definitely. So the question is whether Birds might have such great vision because of their evolutionary history. They're related to dinosaurs. They actually are dinosaurs, technically, living dinosaurs. Um, and dinosaurs had to see very well to be able to catch prey. And that's very true. Um, many birds are also bir things that catch prey, like hawks. What's that? Fleas. Oh, I didn't know that. Some dinosaurs ate fleas. That's cool. Um, but. To answer your question, I think for sure having good vision is very important to be able to see fruit in trees, for example. See a red fruit next to a green leaf is actually a pretty hard sensory task. But the scale of how good birds are seems like it's way beyond what you'd need for the demands of catching prey or spotting fruit. But you've, that's a good question. Ed? Does this hold for all birds? No. Good question. Um, so. Birds that, oh, does this hold for all birds? Um, some birds can't even really see color. Birds like hawks and owls. Um, owls, yeah, they see motion very, very well. Exactly, and they have a high density of rods in their eyes, which are the sort of light sensitive cells. Exactly, so, which makes it kind of cool. One thing I would love to do is see whether vision in birds of paradise is better than vision in like a color-seeing bird that doesn't really have a lot of sexual selection. This is my dream experiment. 
<laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> yes. I'll speak loud so you don't have to repeat the question. <laughs> no, I'm just curious about what it's called, Prowhorn? The yeah. Uh -huh. Why does it maintain its capacity for speed if the selection pressure has been removed? Ooh, and great. The other question. question I have is a more general question because you're giving examples here. At least as I recall this, when you speak about sexual selection and the birds as females that are doing the selecting, right? Yeah, generally. Mm -hmm. But how, how does it look across many species? Uh, and what other factors Plan. determine whether it's the male or the female that's doing the selecting? Great question. Okay, so first question. It's very complicated in humans, right? Yes. Absolutely. Um, I'll take, okay, first question first, which was why is the pronghorn still so fast if the cheetah is long gone? And the answer is the cheetah is not that long gone. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it seems likely that the pronghorns will drift to become slower and slower because there isn't the intense pressure keeping them fast. But you never know and evolution takes a long time, mm -hmm. even through random drift like that. And then the second question was, I've already forgotten. The sexual selection, why? Oh, the yes. The female, right, so the question is, why do females more often choose males than vice versa? I didn't say that, but you're telling me that. Oh, oh, I just wondered about it. Yeah, well, this is a really good question. I think, on average, it is true. More frequently, females choose males rather than the opposite. And one reason, again, could be that females tend to invest more. Yeah. Eggs are very costly to make an egg as a bird. Right. If you're a mammal bearing, you know, you're growing baby or babies in your body, that's very costly. Um, but there are a lot of cool examples of females being kind of the colorful ones who defend the territory and males being the ones who kind of stay home and sit on the nest. And I don't know very much about, and I don't know that anybody does, about what determines sort of the different sex roles. Um, it's a great question. Okay, oh, one more, one more question. Another example of that was that uh, the dodo, it could fly to avoid prey, but then it evolved to not do that so the humans can hunt it. Yeah, exactly. The dodo who evolved from flying ancestors but lost that ability, and then when humans came onto the island, it had no defenses. Great point. All right, with that, I think we will dive in. And I think what we'll do is talk a little bit about super black birds, then maybe take an intermission where you guys can get some snacks. And then those who want to stick around and talk about super black spiders and more thoughts about that can do so. So super black birds of paradise. So this project was done as part of a team, as most of science is. And these are my teammates. So Teresa is a brilliant ornithologist uh, who knows a lot about evolution. Todd Harvey is also a brilliant ornithologist, um, also does a lot of work in Hollywood. So if you've seen the Lord of the Rings movies, you've seen some of his work on light and magic. And then Rick Prum, who recently was in town for a book talk, um, is a professor at Yale who studies ornithology and the evolution of beauty. So Birds of Paradise, again, live, on, live in Papua New Guinea. Um, they live in sort of very lush forested areas where there probably aren't too many predators sitting around and where there's pretty plentiful food. And there are many, many species that have been discovered. So a quick overview of how color works in nature. Color can generally come in one of two forms. So the first one is pigment. And in this room, most of the things we're looking at are probably colored by pigment. Our skin and hair is colored by something called melanin. Um, and Harvard actually has a pigment library where you can go look at all sorts of incredibly weird pigments, including pigments made from human mummies. Pretty weird. Uh, and just, so how pigment works, there are little molecules that selectively absorb some wavelengths of light and reflect others. So if you're looking at, you know, my sort of blue dress, it's absorbing all of the light except for blue and reflecting blue. So blue light is hitting your eye and that's what you see. Then your brain does a lot of sort of processing to get the actual image before you. And in birds, pigment comes in many, many forms. There's a huge variety. So melanin pigment, just like we have, is often what you see in birds that kind of blend into their surroundings. They're black or red or brown. But there's a bunch of other pigments, too, that create a beautiful rainbow of colors, um, a real diversity. If you're interested in chemistry, happy to talk about that afterwards. So pigment is the first kind of color. Uh, the second type is called structural color. So light comes in many different colors. And the colors are determined by the wavelength of light. So as you can see, red has a longer wavelength all the way down to blue, which has a very short wavelength. So structural color works by taking advantage of this fundamental property of light. 
So if you imagine constructing a tiny structure with a bunch of little beams that are spaced out at about the wavelength of uh, blue light, you can imagine how that would interact differently with red light than it would with blue, right? So things that are structured on the scale of kind of 300 to 700 nanometers, which is this range of wavelengths, uh, produce structural color. So most things that are glossy are produced by structural color. In fact, all things that are glossy are structural, um, which means that depending on which angle you look at it, you see something totally different because the structure is, you know, oriented in a certain direction. And just to show you some pictures of structural color, these are cross sections of a peacock feather. So see these little tiny uh, circles? This, these are little packets of melanin, the pigment I mentioned earlier, and they're structured and ordered at the proper scale to selectively reflect green light. And compare that to a white feather where there's no such sort of nanoscale structuring. Um, so that's how structural color works. And if you see in nature things that are, again, glossy or blue, it's probably structural color. Does anyone know why the sky is blue? Ooh, lots of people. Okay, you haven't spoken yet. How about you? Yeah, or if you want to explain. Because there's reflection, the water's reflection on the sky. Yeah, it's, it's related to that phenomenon for sure. Um, it's basically, because blue has such short wavelengths of light, it's more easily scattered by all the little random things that are sitting in the air. So it's much harder to sort of selectively scatter red light than it is to selectively scatter blue light, which is why the sky is blue and why so many birds are blue through structural color. So when I look at this bird and all of its relatives that also have very dark black feathers, it makes me wonder what on earth is making it so dark. I mean, when you look at this and you saw in the video, you really can't even tell what shape it is. You can't even tell you're looking at a bird, I would say, honestly. It sort of looks like a shadow or a black hole. So my questions about this are both what and why. So what on earth is making this color? And also why did it evolve? We touched a little bit on the why already. So it looks very dark to our human eyes, but in science you have to actually quantify things. So here is a normal black bird. I know it looks pretty dark, but take my word for it, it's normal looking. <laughs> Surprisingly, it's actually a bird of paradise. It's one of the very few birds of paradise that just looks boring and bland. <laughs> And compare that to one of our super black birds, which again looks sort of like there's a hole in the page. So a normal black bird, this is a reflectance specter, just showing what percentage of light does it reflect over all the range of uh, wavelengths I showed you before. A normal black bird reflects or absorbs about 95% of light. So it's reflecting very little, about 5%, and absorbing everything else. So that's what a standard black object looks like. But the super black birds of paradise we look at, so look at this scale. It's absorbing 99.9% .9 of light. In fact, more than 99.9. .9. I just couldn't fit more numbers on that graph without it being small font. And if you look at a whole bunch of birds stacked up, again, here's all the normal birds reflecting around 95%. All of the super black birds are, you can't even really see them on the graph because they're reflecting so little light. So question one, it's not just our eyes. They are actually that dark. Um, and the other weird thing is that it's a very, very flat spectra, which if you know anything about color is very unusual because usually pigments vary over the course of wavelengths and how good they are at absorbing light. So first question answered, they're very dark. Second question, how exactly are they so dark? So part of my research involves looking at things under a scanning electron microscope. And to do that, uh, you need to coat your objects in gold. That's just a part of the process, because otherwise the electrons collect on the surface. So here is a normal black feather coated in gold. As you can see, what used to be black now looks gold. But if you coat a super black feather in gold, it still looks completely black. So thinking back to what I was telling you about pigment and structure, what does this tell you, if anything? Remember, our hair is made of melanin pigment. What would happen if you coated your hair with gold? It would look gold, right? Most things would look gold if you coat them with gold. It's deeper than just the pigment. Exactly. So there's something other than pigment going on. And this was a total surprise to me, by the way. So I was like, did the machine break? I'm supposed to be coating it in gold. <laughs> that was surprise number one of the project. So then we got to actually look at the feather under a microscope. So here's a picture of what a normal feather looks like from this bird. And just to sort of orient you, feathers are like trees or fractals, whereas you zoom in on the feather, every little piece also looks like a feather. So it looks like I'm just showing you a picture of a feather, but I'm showing you a very, very zoomed in picture of this tiny piece of the feather. So that's a normal black feather. And this is what a super black feather looks like. 
it sort of looks like a coral reef or a bottle brush. And if you're a feather nerd like me, this is incredibly surprising. So another moment of sort of awe, you know, alone at the microscope and like <laughs> leaping backwards. <laughs> So let me show you a few more. So here's another example of a super black bird. Here's the one I just showed you. And while it doesn't look at all like other bird feathers, there is something else that it looks like. And this is something that um, my old mentor, Leo, when he knew I was studying these super black birds, he said, you know, hey, I just got some supplies into lab that look really similar to the, the birds you're studying. You know, they look like a black hole. They look fuzzy. And he showed me like a little Petri dish filled with something called super black silicon. This was actually accidentally discovered here at Harvard. So silicon is very shiny, right? And this lab at Harvard was trying to texture the silicon for various purposes. And they realized if you texture it in a certain way, it suddenly becomes incredibly black. And if you look at this shape, to me it looks an awful lot like this. Lots of tiny prongs sticking upwards, no flat surfaces. And what's going on in all of these cases is structural absorption. So the light is being multiply scattered between all of the little peaks and valleys. And with each scattering event, a little bit of the light is absorbed. And that's true whether you have pigment sitting in there to do the absorbing, or even if you're an incredibly shiny metal. Still, the multiple scattering is so efficient that you can get this incredibly dark surface. And, you know, we had this theory, it looked an awful lot like the super black stuff people have made, but you have to test it again. You can't just say, oh, it looks a lot like that thing. It's probably structurally absorbing. So we took a feather from a super black bird and we essentially did a complicated procedure where we took a CT scan of it, extracted the surface and made a 3D model. And once you have a 3D model, you can do ray tracing where you sort of simulate the interaction of light with that little tiny 3D model. And what we found, and this is just a schematic I made because the real images are hard to look at in a PowerPoint slide, is that indeed the light does get multiply scattered around between the little prongs of the feather. So again, just a schematic, a normal blackbird has all these flat surfaces sitting there for light to bounce off of, using bounce colloquially, whereas a super blackbird, tons of multiple scattering, very dark surfaces. Another interesting thing is that, you know, these birds do reflect some light. They're not perfectly black. Nothing, mostly, is perfectly black. Some things are in space. Um, <laughs> but the little light that it does reflect, it directs away from where the female is standing. So remember in the video, the bird is really intense about like making sure the female can only see him straight on. That's because he is reflecting light. And if you manage to get a sidelong view, you do see a little bit of specular reflection of the gleams, the white gleams. So I told you about pigment, the sort of selective absorption of light. We know a lot about structural color at the nanoscale. And what this paper shows is that throughout nature, there's a lot of opportunities for microscale structural absorption as well. So usually around now is when people begin to ask me, you know, what might this be useful for? Are there any applications of this super black feather? And it's a good question because evolution has inspired lots of really efficient human design. Evolution has had many, many years of tinkering around to come up with a very energetically efficient solution to all kinds of problems, problems that we now share in our sort of human lives. And one very famous example is the Shinkansen or the bullet train in Japan which actually was modeled after a kingfisher beak and which saved something like 50% of uh, the energy efficiency because the trains are constantly going in and out of mountains, uh, tunnels in the mountains. And that's a sort of big pressure differential and a differential in the type of air. Kingfisher beaks are designed to sort of plunge into water without losing a bunch of speed, without making noise, without creating huge ripples. And the same exact challenges were needed for the bullet train. That's one cool example. And my other favorite example is uh, termite mounds, which are sort of self-thermoregulating, uh, are a great way of cheaply heating and cooling human buildings. So I think evolution is a hugely uh, undertapped resource for coming up with design inspiration. And you've probably all heard of how Velcro was invented based on those annoying little burrs that stick to you when you go into the woods. <laughs> so coming back to the super black potential applications, the great news is that somebody has already come up with a wonderful material that structurally absorbs light. Have you guys seen Vantablack around the internet? Yep. A few people have. I, people email me this like once per week, you know. <laughs> um, and so they have done a, a wonderful job of making something that's even better at absorbing light than what nature has come up with. The one thing that I think the birds might be able to teach us is that 
You know, this is a material that's relatively brittle, it kind of breaks easily, and it's very expensive to manufacture. Whereas bird feathers are made out of keratin, which is a sort of cheap, simple protein. And so I think what the bird feathers show us is that there's potential to cheaply 3D print something that's flexible, that's strong. You know, these feathers, you can step on them, you can drop them and bend them. I've done all of these things and they still look black, you know, whereas this is a lot more fragile. So I think there's some potential to sort of cheaply mass produce structures inspired by the birds that would be useful for collecting light for solar cells or for sort of like optical design. Um, if you're an astronomer, like Rohan, uh, you do a lot of very precise measurements and stray light sort of scattering around is a big problem for you. So the moral of that story is that there may be some applications in making things cheaper or easier to make, but humans are very smart and have already come up with very good uh, light absorbing materials. So finally, we come to the crux of the matter, which is the why. Why on earth are they evolving something that absorbs so much light, 99.9% .9 of light? And to illustrate that, I want to show you a few images. Which gray band is darker? <laughs> Raise your hand if you think it's this one. Yay, thanks supportive teamies. What about this one? <laughs> As you may be able to guess, the bands are actually the same color. But the way our eyes and brains work, they process what you see and nearby colors greatly influence, nearby darknesses or lightnesses greatly, greatly influence what your brain actually sees. Here's another very cool optical illusion. These boxes are actually the same color, even though they look very different based on their surroundings. And finally, my favorite, although it's a little bit hard to see in here, which square is darker, A or B? A, but they're the same. And I particularly like this example because it shows what your brain does with shadows. So, if you're holding an apple, you want the apple to look red, whether you're standing in the sun or in the shade, right? And luckily, we have evolved ways of accounting for how much light is hitting an object. And the way we do that is structures both in our eyes and in our brains divide out how much light is hitting something. And we do that using these white gleams on the surfaces of objects. So essentially, all of the reactions of all your color sensitive cells are getting divided out by the average amount of illumination hitting an object. But super black is very, very well designed to have no gleams at all. So not only does it absorb most light, it also is not sending any white gleams back to the observing female. So what it does is kind of cool. It actually makes nearby colors look like they're glowing. Because the color looks like it's sitting in the middle of a very dark shadow, looks like there's no light hitting it at all, but the color is still that bright. So super black is a bird <laughs> optical illusion. And I think this sort of extremeness and sneakiness of super black is good evidence that we are seeing an arms race. Uh, with that, I think I will pause for questions. <laughs> Great. So should we do intermission or should we do formal questions then? Okay, cool, questions, yes. Some pigments survive longer than others, and does that have to do with the structures? Oh, great question. The question is, some pigments survive longer than others, and does that have to do with the structures? It does. Um, nobody has studied whether the kinds of structures I just described influence pigment preservation, but pigments stick around for many, many years, in fact, millions of years if they're a fossil, if they're packaged in certain ways inside something called a melanosome. So the way the pigment is packaged inside your body definitely influences whether it sticks around. Good question. Ava. Is there calorically <laughs> more or less costly to form the super black structure versus having a black pigment? This is a great question. And I wish it were easier to measure the cost of a trait. Um, the only thing I can say about that is if you like weigh a super black feather and weigh a normal black feather, they weigh pretty much the same. But that's, you know, weight is not a perfect proxy for cost, obviously. <laughs> so it's, it's an open question. Good question. Yes? Are there other places that you might expect to find this, places people haven't noticed it yet? The super black? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, um, oh, yep. Are there other places you might expect to find super black? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, the spiders, as has been revealed by the title of my talk, also have structural black. 
And in fact, another thing I get emailed about once a week is a picture of an animal with a black patch on it. And so now I've gotten pictures of uh, lizards that clearly have very, very dark black. Uh, nudibranchs, which are little sea slugs that are brightly colored, have very, very dark black on them. So I think, yes, you see it, and you see it in snakes and butterflies. Other people have described it there. So one cool thing about it is it seems very like fundamental to systems of evolution through sexual selection. That's a great question. Maybe one more question before intermission. Yes. This is a hard question because that, it's a hard question for me to ask. I'm a little confused. Yeah. So you take the bird of paradise. And is he revealing this color, or is he producing it by structurally, you know, shifting his feathers or something like that when he displays to the female? Yeah, so the question is, is the male kind of revealing the color when he displays, or is he triggering it or shifting it through the movements yeah, of the he, feathers? When you watch it, it seems it's not there, and then he produces it somehow. Like, I don't yeah, know. oh, that's a great question. With this particular bird, he sort of hides these display feathers tucked up against his body under his wing, and then when it's time to display, he you know, shifts them out. Um, what about the eyes? Are those eyes? No, they're oh, not. They're yeah, <laughs> they're like so spots. I missed his eyes. That guy got blue eyes. Yeah, I don't know. I wish. Okay. You explained uh, my, that was my complexity. Oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. And for some birds, the, they look super black all the time because it's just on their side okay. or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Great, okay, time for intermission. Please feel free to go get some snacks or come up and chat more. <laughs> Thank you all for sticking around for more Super Black. It's very exciting. Um, you know, one thing I do want to talk about briefly before we go on to the very cool spiders is a bit more about like why I think this is an arms race dynamic. And something I didn't say is that if you're a bird of paradise and if you're a male, you may well not get a chance to mate because only something like half of males in many species actually get to mate with females. So, you know, if a female has a preference for a blue feather, the only males that get to pass on their genes will be males that have a blue feather. So then all the males have blue feathers in the next generation. So then she has to add something else on, you know, because she only wants to pick the best male. So even bluer, like a feather that's even bluer is her new preference. And through that dynamic over time, uh, and you can model this using uh, math, it, it leads to intense elaboration. Uh, and if you're interested, I'd love to talk more, more with you about uh, arms races in general. Okay, so as we already discussed, super black is a bird optical illusion where it makes the colors look even brighter to a female. And I mentioned this to some of you, but we all as mammals have an evolved history of existing in the dark, in shadow. That's what early mammals did. So our eyes, even though we are now day living creatures, our eyes are very good at seeing in conditions of low light. So there's some reason to think that what looks like an optical illusion to us would be even more extreme for these birds. These birds are very day living, so they don't have very good low light vision. So, you know, to them, this may look even more extreme and brighter because this sort of optical illusion of shadow is something that they're not as evolutionarily prepared for as we are. Anyway, so this brings me to the question of did the same thing evolve in the peacock spiders? And you probably noticed in those videos, each of the peacock spiders I showed you had some very dark black velvety patches. So convergent evolution, a quick sort of primer, Convergent evolution happens when animals that are unrelated evolve the same sort of shape or body form or structure. So all of these different animals evolve to look very similar, even though they're not very closely related because they're all underwater, pre you know, all underwater predators. So convergent evolution in short is a sign that a trait is serving some purpose. It's very, you know, clearly it's very good to be shaped like that if you're trying to hunt underwater. So I'm interested in whether this evolved convergently, you know, another example of structural black, because it would show that it's taking advantage of some very fundamental feature of being a sexually selected organism, like my idea that it's evolving through an arms race, no matter what animal you are. So super black spiders, which I'm very excited to say is a project I did both with my current supervisor and with Rick again, and with Tori McCoy. You may notice her last name is the same as my last name. She is my sister. <laughs> People used to think we were twins. I don't really see it. Um, <laughs> but Tori is absolutely brilliant, and I have to talk about her briefly because she was recently written up by Forbes magazine 
because of her cool work. It was one of those like Forbes 30 under 30 things. She is studying the preservation of proteins in amber. So you've probably seen Jurassic Park. She's literally trying to extract information about proteomics from dinosaur feathers preserved in amber. So stay tuned for her to clone the first dinosaur. <gasps> and this is my favorite picture of Tori. I get to do this because she's my sister. I think she looks like she's plotting to rule the world. It's at her first communion. <laughs> she actually got in a fight at her first communion too. Okay, so quick reminder of the peacock spiders. I can't resist showing you this video. Somebody remixed the video to make it sort of match very nicely to a very famous song. <laughs> That. So peacock spiders, um, I think, are a very good candidate to look to see whether they have the same evolved trait that birds of paradise do because they're very similar. So just like birds of paradise, females are very choosy. Only some males get to mate, only the ones that they choose. So lots of sexual selection. As you have seen, they have incredibly elaborate colors and ornaments and really precise dances. And they also have wonderful color vision. It's a lot less well understood than bird color vision, but they too can see in the ultraviolet and can very finely compare light uh, through some very interesting sort of eye architecture. Uh, so when I think about peacock spiders, I actually like to call them the spiders of paradise because I think that they're the same. So again, my question is, was there a convergent evolution of structural black? And remember, the structures reduce the gleams so that they can sort of trick your brain and trick your eyes. Did this convergently evolve in this behavioral similar group of animals? So to do this, Tori and I did some hyperspectral imaging, which is a way of uh, basically taking a photo of something where every single pixel encodes information about exactly what color is being reflected. And then also, again, scanning electron microscopy. So short answer to the question how dark it is, it is very dark. Just like the birds, it absorbs over 99% of light. Uh, I also took sort of images of the blue areas and the red. And then the key question, which is what does it look like up close? So here's what a normal spider cuticle looks like. Kind of the spider's skin is called cuticle. Here is what the super black spider looks like. So you may notice these weird little things. When I saw sort of up close what the spiders look like, I thought to myself, yes, this looks exactly like the bird of paradise feather. Don't you think? But unfortunately, those are the red parts. So those things that I was like, yes, found it. They are actually the bright red scales. So then I thought maybe it was like these weird things. Maybe something strange is going on there. Those are the blue scales. Somebody else studied them and found that that's actually a very cool structural uh, diffraction grating that selects for blue. So it turns out it's the background that's black. It's just this sort of boring looking bumpy surface. So zooming in a little bit more, again, those are the colorful scales. Up here you see the very dark black, and down here is a part of the spider that's just kind of standard normal brownish cuticle. So we took a cross section of that bumpy area. I'll show it to you here and it sort of has a very clear shape where they look like little semi-spheres or even like cones. Interestingly, down here is a bunch of melanin. Remember that pigment I told you about before? So these are little tiny granules of melanin sitting below the bumpy surface. Okay, it's challenge time. What does this array of bumps that I just showed you remind you of? If anything. Sound absorption? Sound absorption? Like what? Uh, the phone sticks under doors. Ah, yes. Excellent answer. I don't have a picture of that, but it totally looks like those sound absorbing things. Yes. Any other ideas? Yes? Egg crate. Egg crate, yeah. Actually, it does look a lot like an egg crate. If egg crates were tiny, it would look exactly like that. <laughs> Sand dunes. Sand dunes. Oh, absolutely. So there are many things that kind of have this shape. The thing that it most reminds me of, and that once somebody guessed this, is a moth eye. I think it actually looks almost exactly like the sort of array of little tiny bumps on a moth eye. And it doesn't end there. Turns out that flowers also have arrays of tiny bumps on their petals. And the taller bumps make for a richer color. 
So same amount of pigment, taller bumps make for a redder flower. These also show up in rainforest plants. So in the leaves of plants that exist way in the understory, way beneath the towering canopies, you see very similar scale and shape bumps in these guys. And then finally, the weirdest one, I showed this to my friend Amos, he's a student in the applied physics department, and he said, oh yeah, that looks just like sea stars. It's like, what? Like, that is not what I expected. Turns out, brittle sea star arms also have tiny arrays of bumps at exactly the right scale and shape. So we're thinking now about mechanism, you know? These are all different colors, all different things. What do all of these surfaces have in common? Any ideas? Yes? Specific colors. Specific colors, absolutely. So, you know, these want to be bright red. These need to be working their chloroplasts to, you know, do photosynthesis, so they're green, absolutely. I think related to that, the answer is all of them care a lot about light. And these are basically micro lens arrays for capturing light. So, you know, if you're a flower, you want to attract pollinators to come to you, so you want a really vivid color. So you focus light onto the pigment beneath your flower surface. If you're a leaf sitting beneath, you know, in the understory of a jungle, very little light is getting through to you. So the light that does, you really want to capture as much of it as you can. Because again, you know, plants need to do photosynthesis to survive. The sea star arms is a really weird one. It turns out that they actually see with their arms. So this array of micro lenses are actually on top of photosensitive pigments that are receptive to light. So somehow they flee, they sense and flee from predators based on their arms seeing the predator approach. They're like rudimentary eyes on their whole body. And moth eyes need to see, so they need to focus light so they can see. So in short, these are a bunch of little lenses that focus light onto the pigment below. And not only that, they are both focusing light and just like the sound absorbing things, so that was a really great observation, they are diffusely scattering anything that happens to be scattered. So, you know, if you want to absorb sound, you don't want there to be a piercing sound passing through, you want to kind of break it up and scatter it, scattering the waves. And the same exact thing happens with this. What that means is that there's no gleams, as we talked about before. So, indeed, the spiders, convergently with the birds of paradise, evolve these structurally absorbing super black patches that are specifically designed not to have the kind of information we need to know how much light is hitting an object. The really cool thing for me, because I'm really interested now in sort of surfaces and optics, is that they evolved it through a totally different physical form. These micro lens arrays that are fundamental in many areas of nature. So any questions about these cool spiders? A bit shorter because I already kind of gave away all the cool stuff with the birds. Yes? Maybe, uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna get this right, but you just said something about evolving exactly the right structure to remove the gleams, which are the information that we need to calibrate to decide how bright something really is. That statement assumes that the observers actually operate that way. But when you described it originally, you told us that it was a property of, human, of how we perceive brightness. Mm. So my question is, uh, just like my question before about how you know the birds can finally distinguish colors, what experiments have been done to prove to you that the birds or the observers of the spiders, that they actually rely on leaniness to make the same judgment call that you know that humans do? This is a great question. So the question to repeat in a sentence is, how do we know that birds also use gleams to assess brightness the way that humans do? And the answer is actually, we know better in other animals than we do in humans. Because in other animals, you can implant an electrode into their brain, you can cut their eye open and look at it. So this is a very fundamental feature of vision. And you see it in basically any animal that can see is it controlling for how much light is hitting it. And so for some animals, we've done really invasive, careful experiments to show this. Um, I don't know if anybody has done a super invasive thing with birds, but We've done studies on their cone cells and their eyes that show that they do take into account background illumination. And in some animals, like goldfish, they've literally run the experiment where they've showed it a blue color, then they show it blue with a black, you know, a very black frame, and it does get tricked by the frame. They have never done this with birds, and I would really like to, even though I think it's 
pretty likely that they would sort of have that perceptual illusion as well. Um, but the goldfish is, is a good study because they can also see four types of light, including ultraviolet, just like birds do. So a combination of direct experimental evidence and the behavioral evidence in things like goldfish makes me pretty confident. But that's an excellent question. You can't just assume that everything is like a human. So. Yes? So in the beginning, you talked about how maybe uh, melanin and those kind of pigments weren't as strong a black as the structural black or blue that you talked about with the birds. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the, the spiders are just like, just the pigments on steroids and not like a totally different kind, like the, the kind of color like the birds are. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, uh, pigment doesn't seem to be as good as structures at absorbing light, but the spiders are using melanin. They're just kind of pumping them up with steroids, this surface. Yeah, absolutely. And you may have noticed, let me just show you that slide again. Uh, but aren't birds doing their own thing? Like, theirs doesn't really require that much melanin. Yeah, exactly. So it, I guess, is it really that good of a convergent evolution if they're s not that similar? Yeah. One of them is just, like, updating their pigments, and the others is, like, thinking of it or making their own thing. Yeah, it's like, is it really convergent evolution if, if one is just updating pigments and the other is totally doing their own thing with structure? Yeah, a great question. Um, I think in short, you know, you can call something conversion evolution or not, as you wish, but what I wanted to show you is, so this line shows how black the spider is. As I sort of showed you before, if you're just using melanin, the line would be up here, and it would slope upward like this, basically. That's a fundamental feature of the type of chemical, the type of molecule that melanin is. It's just better at absorbing light in this range than it is light in that range. If you remember, the birds looked like this. It was flat. It was almost a completely flat, you know, because they're just as good at absorbing all of those wavelengths of light because of the type of structure they use. And the spiders are in between. You know, they're very good at a lot of light, but they've got this characteristic rise that you see in melanin. So they're definitely not as efficient and dark as the birds are. Um, but I think if you take some sort of measurements, and just look at like total, how much light is being reflected, it is really very similar. Um, I think you're right to kind of challenge the assumption we can just call it convergence, because that gets thrown around a lot. But I think the sort of summing up all the evidence, I'm pretty comfortable saying like, this is an independent evolution of a very dark, structurally enhanced, rather than totally structural, structurally enhanced color. It's a great question, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, guys, well, I, you know, I could talk all day, but I think it's getting a little bit late, so maybe I'll just sort of thank you for your time. Let me just thank the people that Science in the News is funded by. Uh, so, so thank you also so much to the Science in the News organizers for all of your help and work, and a big thanks to all of my funding sources and lab mates and people that have helped me so much with these projects. Science really is a team effort. And thank you all for your attention. Uh, please feel free to come on up and talk afterwards.